Hi, welcome to another episode of Live from the Trevor Zoo. It's great to have you all watching, even if you can't be here with us in person. We're going to continue doing these Facebook broadcasts every Wednesday at 4 p.m. I'm Tiffany Hatfield. I graduated from Millbrook in 2018. I originally started working at the zoo in 2013 when I started as a volunteer in our summer program. I also became a student head curator during my time at Millbrook. I'm currently majoring in animal science at Penn State. And as the Millbrook students are gone on break, I come back to help feed the animals around the zoo. Today we're going to talk about one of our endangered species. In fact, the most endangered species at the zoo, the red wolf, and the two red wolves who live here at the Trevor Zoo. Red wolves are the most endangered canid or member of the dog family. There are only around 200 remaining red wolves in the world. Red wolves were originally living in the wild throughout the southeastern and south central United States, from the Atlantic Ocean to central Texas, as far north as New York State, and as far south as Florida and the Gulf of Mexico. Just a reminder, please feel free to ask questions throughout today's episode. Just type them into the comments and we'll answer them towards the end of the show. So here at the Trevor Zoo, we currently have two red wolves, Clifford and Shy. Over the years, there have been a number of wolves at the zoo. In fact, back in the Frank Trevor days, we had a timber wolf named Timber. In January of 1993, the Trevor Zoo received two red wolves, Ashley, a male, and Divot, a female. This was the beginning of our participation in the Red Wolf SSP, or Species Survival Plan, as is administrated by the Association of Zoos and Aquariums and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Five wolves were born to Ashley and Divot in May of 1993. This was our first litter. In 2003, one of those wolves, Dina, gave birth to five pups here at the Trevor Zoo with her mate, Durham. Luna was our most recent breeding wolf. She was born in May of 2006 and came to the Trevor Zoo in November of 2007. She and her mate Shiloh, who was only here for a year, had six pups born on May 2nd in 2012. There were two males and four females in that group, the fourth litter of red wolves born at the Trevor Zoo. Luna passed away on September 20th of 2018 and was over 12 years old at the time of her death. She spent 11 of those years with us. Clifford, who is our current male wolf, was part of Luna and Shiloh's litter born in 2012. The other red wolves from that litter were transferred to the Charlestown Landing Animal Forest in South Carolina in 2013 and were kept together for many years. Unfortunately, Clifford is blind due to PRA, progressive retinal atrophy, which excludes him as a breeding candidate. After Luna's death in 2018, Clifford was alone, but fortunately, the red wolf SSP found him a roommate. Shy, no relation to Shiloh, came to us from the Beardsley Zoo in Bridgeport, Connecticut in November of 2019. She was born on April 3rd, 2007, and she and Clifford get along very well. So here are some facts about red wolves. Despite their name, red wolves can have a variety of coat colors, including yellow, black, brown, gray, and red. Often the fur behind their legs and ears will have a reddish tint. They are similar in size to a German Shepherd. The males grow to be around 30 inches tall at the shoulder and can weigh around 60 to 80 pounds. They're smaller than gray wolves, but bigger than coyotes. Red wolves are carnivorous and therefore mostly eat meat. Their primary food consists of small rodents, rabbits, raccoons, and deer. They will also eat insects and berries. Red wolves are native to North America. They prefer habitats of forest, coastal prairies, and sometimes swamps. They have no natural predators and are mostly nocturnal animals, meaning they are active at night and sleep during the day. Male and female red wolves typically pair bond for life. Red wolves will live for eight or nine years in the wild, but can live longer in captivity. Red wolves live and travel in small family packs of five to eight animals. The wolf pack will have a territory that it will defend from other packs, and they will sometimes hunt alone or together with their pack. The wolves communicate through a variety of ways, such as howling, scent marking, facial expressions, and body movements. For example, the dominant leaders will lift their tails and stand tall when facing another wolf. In each pack, there's a dominant male wolf and a dominant female wolf that will lead the pack. Usually only the dominant pair of wolves will have puppies. Red wolf puppies are born in litters of two to eight pups. When born, the pups are tiny and their eyes are still closed. They are entirely dependent on their mothers for protection and food. As they grow up, the entire pack will help in taking care of them and protecting them. When they have grown to maturity, they may venture out on their own to form their own pack. Red wolves are currently on the critically endangered list and were designated an endangered species in 1967. The red wolf was nearly driven to extinction by the mid-1900s due to aggressive predator control programs. 
habitat destruction, and extensive hybridization with coyotes. Coyotes' original range was in the southwest, and with the extinction of red wolves, the coyotes' range increased and expanded into the red wolves' historical range. By the late 1960s, red wolves could only be found in small numbers in the Gulf Coast of western Louisiana and eastern Texas. Fourteen of these survivors were selected to be the founders of a captive bred population, which was established in the Point Defiance Zoo and Aquarium between 1974 and 1980 when the red wolf was declared extinct in the wild. In 1987, captive bred wolves were released into the Alligator River National Wildlife Refuge in North Carolina. Of 63 wolves released from 1987 to 1994, the population rose to as many as 100 to 120 individuals by 2012. However, due to the lack of regulation enforcement by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and buy-in from key stakeholders, the population declined to 40 individuals in 2018 and now only about 10 as of 2020. The future of red wolves remains a big question mark, but AZA facilities like ours are trying to protect this species and help it recover. In fact, we are doubling our efforts, and we'll tell you more about that in next week's episode. Now we're going to take, at our, take a look at our red wolf enclosure and how we care for them. So we're on our way to feed our wolves. We're out here behind the North America exhibit, headed behind our wolf enclosure. So this is the backside of our wolf habitat. This is our house for our wolves. So I have this bucket for any old food or any poop we pick up. And then this has our enrichment hay from our bobcat that we're gonna place into their outdoor enclosure later. And this is the wolf diet. So it's a mix of dog food, wet dog food, and their vitamins. So now we're gonna radio that we're going inside our wolf enclosure. It's our protocol to let everybody else in the zoo know that we're going in and where we are. Entering wolf exhibit. So now we're gonna go in the barn. So this is where we feed our wolves. So we have three different spaces in here. We have our tunnel, the main area where we put the food in, and then the den. So first we have to make sure they're not in here. And then we'll close both of the shift doors this way that they can't come in while we go in here. And then we just check to make sure nobody's in there. No one's in there, so it's good. And then we'll go in and clean all up the old food out before we place in the new stuff. So I'm just sweeping out any old hay that got in here and any other old food. And we'll take this out before we place any new food. That way it doesn't get mixed in. stuck in the corner. So this is one of the shift doors for outside. It goes to a smaller area. So we'll usually use these areas to shift the wolves in if we need to sedate them for a vet appointment. That way we can separate them individually instead of having all the wolves just in one space indoors. So these guys, like all of our animals, have indoor-outdoor access all day. So if they want to come in, they can. So they just kind of eat at their own pace. We don't make them eat at any specific time, and the food will sit in here all day for them. Thanks. So I'm just going to add the new food. So we split it into a couple piles. You always want to make sure you have at least one more pile than animals. And then we'll just put all the old food in this bucket.
then this is their den. So we just want to make sure that all the hay in here is clean and dry. So this is where they can go to bed down. This is also where we had the pups a couple years ago. So I'm just going to go in here and fluff up any hay. And if there's any dry, well, everything in here seems dry. But if there's any wet stuff, we would take that out usually or always. But it looks nice and dry and clean and we have enough. And we just make sure both doors are closed. And then we'll open up again for these guys to come in and eat. All right, so now we'll go to their outdoor enclosure and we'll go pick up any old poop or anything else that's out there, any old enrichment, and we'll change their water. So I'm just gonna leave this here and we'll come back and get that on our way out. So here's our outdoor exhibit. So we always have two people going into Wolf. That's our protocol. That way there's always two people to make sure that we can see each other. These guys are really skittish, so they won't come near us usually, but we always have two people just in case. Is our water brush to clean the water and then we always bring in our whistle to alert anybody if something is wrong or to spook the wolves if they come too close. Ready? So here's our wolf enclosure. First we're going to go clean the water so we'll all walk over there together. We try to stay near each other that way we don't scare these guys too much or spook them. Usually they're out here hiding in the brush or under a log. They also have a den dugout that they like to hang out in, especially during the heat of the day. They're not usually out, but I can't really blame them. I don't like being out when it's this hot either. So here's their water. It's automatic and it's also heated. So in the winter time, we don't have to take ice out and they have water fresh all the time. So we just scrub it, get all the dirt out, make sure that nothing's in here, dump it out, and then when we hook it back up, it'll fill itself. We just have to make sure that the lid is on because these guys will actually try to play with it. And then we'll just look around, make sure that there's no old poop or anything out here. Um, I'll put this enrichment out first, so I think we'll just hide it under here. So this is old hay that came out of the Bobcat's box. So she's probably scented on it, so it smells kind of like her. And these guys will have fun. They might roll around in it, sniff it. It's just something new or different for them, um, especially being kind of far away from her. They usually don't see her or smell her at all. So it'll be something new and fun. I'll trade. So now we're gonna go pick up any poop that's over here. We usually don't go into the front of the exhibit because we don't want to spook them out of their holes if they're hiding and we don't want to put too much pressure on them. These guys are wild animals, so we try to keep our distance from these guys and make sure that they stay wild, especially since they are so critically endangered. So I'm not seeing any scat over here. So it looks pretty clean. So I think we'll just, we'll pick up some poop or any old food or anything, but there's not a whole lot. Sometimes these guys will bury it and then it's harder for us to find. Go ahead. So now we'll head out. So we just hang everything back up so it's ready for the next time we come in and we're ready to head out. So 
now that we're out, we just radio to let everybody know that we're out and that we're finished in there. Exiting wolf enclosure. And that's how we take care of our two wolves. Thanks for watching. As I mentioned earlier, since we've had red wolves at the zoo, we've been participating in their conservation efforts as now managed by AZA Species Survival Plan. In next week's episode, our director, Dr. Alan Tusinia, will be joined by a special guest to talk more about the future of red wolves and our future plans here at the zoo. Now we're going to take a look at some online resources that will include all of these links in the show description. First is the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. They initiated the efforts to conserve and recover the species in 1967. Their webpage on red wolves has a lot of information that we reviewed today. You can also check out the current status of the red wolf recovery program. So here they have a recovery timeline on everything they've done since 1967 in hopes of recovering and trying to save the species. They also have new facts and more facts about the habitat, range, diet, behavior, and more about the red wolves. There are also two special facilities in the United States that focus solely on, red wolf, on wolf conservation and breeding programs, and we've worked with both of them in the past. The first is the Endangered Wolf Center near Eureka, Missouri. Their website is www.endangeredwolfcenter.org. So here you can meet their pack and also see videos on their webcam and other saved videos. They also have different wild canids, such as maned wolves, swift foxes, African painted dogs and fennec foxes, as well as the red wolves and Mexican wolves. Lastly, we have the Wolf Conservation Center, which is located near the Trevor Zoo, just down in Westchester County. Their website is, ne is New York Wolf, which is nywolf.org. You can also meet their wolves and see their webcams. These guys have red wolves, Mexican gray wolves, and their ambassador wolves, which travel to different schools and events. They're normally open to the public for special programs and group visits. So now let's hear your questions, and I'll do my best to answer them. If you guys have any questions, just go ahead and type them into the comments now. So Terry asks, what kind of dog food do you use? So our wolves get a special blend of three different kinds. So it's red flannel, natural balance, and Missouri canine. They also get uh, some wet food on top of that, too. Irene asked, if kibble is the regular meal, do you give them raw meat, frozen rabbit, et cetera, at some times? So their PM diet is frozen uh, thawed meat, so they'll get different enrichment meats. So sometimes they'll get some steaks or some different enrichment meats. So they do get raw meat on a daily basis too. Terry also asked, are they similar to coyotes? So this is a really interesting question that Dr. T is going to talk a little bit more about next week's episode. So these guys are fairly similar to coyotes. They can actually interbreed with coyotes, which is part of the issue in their recovery programs in the wild is that these guys can interbreed and have viable offspring um, and have a hybridization event. But I'll save that for next week's episode more with Dr. T. Is that it for questions? Yeah. So if you guys enjoyed this video, I'll remind you guys so you can see our previous episodes on our YouTube channel, which is youtube.com forward slash Trevor Zoo Millbrook. You can also check out our live streaming cameras on our lemur and red panda exhibits, as well as our pond camera at millbrook.org forward slash Trevor Zoo Live. Thank you guys for spending part of your Wednesday with us. We really appreciate all the support from people in New York, the United States, and beyond. We really hope that you guys will be here soon. And until then, be well, and we'll see you soon.